Dover Rider was one of the pre, pre, pre mm, one of the first people to work on noticing the patterns of all these different elements. And he came up with these groups of three elements, like this one, okay, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Last week we looked at the patterns here. This is increasing, this is increasing, this is increasing, this is increasing, okay? We looked at copper, silver, and gold. We saw that all three of those right here lined up, copper, silver, and gold. All three of those have a, are good conductive electricity. They're all used in jewelry. They're all used in electronics. Okay, so a lot of similarities. Another of Doberiner's tribes is calcium, strontium, and barium. Right here above Terry Lane's head, calcium, strontium, and barium. All three of those have similar properties. And here you can see increasing pattern, increasing, decreasing, and that one doesn't really have a pattern. Now, along comes a guy by the name of Mendeleev. Okay, so everybody put his name down. Mendeleev, M-E-N-D-E-L-E-E-V. -E 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 That's a hard spelling one, just make sure you re recognize it. Dmitry Mendeleev is known as the father of the periodic table. He's the guy that gave us this thing. You're gonna get one of these later this week to label and know all the different parts of it. Okay, so one of the goals this week is if I ask you, where are all the metals? Where are the non-metals? Where are the metalloids? Where is group one? Where are the transition metals? Where are the uh, halogens found? Where are the noble gases found? There's a bunch of different labels that are attached to this. But Mendeleev is the guy that started to notice that based on Dilber Reiner's work and others, there is a repeated pattern of chemical and physical properties. He started to say, man, every eighth element, I see the same thing happening. Okay, now he organized the elements not according to, sorry about that, not according to increasing atomic mass, but according to properties. And that's what the periodic table shows us. It shows us this amazing series of properties. Every so many elements, you get the same thing. This one burns really well. This one reacts really well. This one doesn't react with anything at all. Um, and there's a pattern. Again, part of life is noticing and looking for patterns. Mendeley is the guy. He noticed density, melting point, boiling point. All three of these are physical properties. But they increase as atomic mass increases. So Mendeley is a smart guy. He's sorting all of these elements into different categories, and trying to organize, and trying to make sense of the world around him, like the fingerprints we talked about the first week of school. Mendeley of story. Let me share this with you. This is one of my favorite. Um, little videos, it's about six minutes long, I believe. And I will share this with you today. Did you get just the right light hands, uh, light switch you for me? Anything. Nice. Okay. You need to get I read pretty much all day. Hello, I'm Hank Green. Welcome to Crash Course Chemistry. Today, we're talking about the most important table. Not the table where they signed the Declaration of Independence, nor any table of contents, nor this table right here, nor the stone table of Aslan. Nay, it is the periodic table of elements, a concise, information-dense catalog of all of the different sorts of atoms in the universe. Today, I want to talk a bit about the creation of this table, which is, to be clear, one of the crowning achievements of human thought. To start out, though, let's close our eyes and pretend. <laughs> Imagine you're in Siberia and you're this is in the story of Mendeleev's life. And your father, who was a professor but had gone Sad. blind, leaving your family of more than ten brothers and sisters destitute, has just died. I know. Downer. Your mom, to support the family, has reopened an abandoned glass-making factory in the small town where you live, largely because she wants to make enough money to send you to school someday. A year passes, the factory burns down. But your mom, she sees your potential. She knows that you have a keen scientific mind and will not see that squandered. So, with your siblings out of the house and on their own, she packs up your belongings, straps them to a horse, and with you in tow, rides 1,200 miles through the Ural Mountains on horseback to a university in Moscow. There, on your behalf, 
She pleads earnestly and effectively, and they reject you. So together, you ride another 400 miles to St. Petersburg, to the school where your father graduated as a scientist, and as luck, or extreme, insane, undeniably Russian persistence would have it, they accept you, and your saddle-worn butt as a pupil. Your mother, having completed her mission, promptly dies. If you're doing your imagining as I've told you, you might feel a tremendous debt to your mother and a very deep desire to ensure that you achieve something on par with the sacrifices she made for you. And maybe that's one reason why Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev became the crown jewel of Russian science and a theorist who revolutionized how we see the world. Mendeleev spent a great deal of time in laboratories as a student studying the burgeoning new field of chemistry. He worked with all the elements that you could work with at the time, and his knowledge gave him unique insights into their properties. So those insights would come in handy. But don't imagine we're Mendeleev again. I, I like doing that. And, and we know a bunch of stuff about chemistry, which, you know, you don't yet. Yet, but we're imagining. So it's the 1860s. And about 60 elements are known to mankind, and their atomic weights are mostly known as well. So the simplest thing was just to sort them in order of their atomic weights. But interestingly, you, because you're clever pants, realize that the most significant relationships seem to have nothing to do with the atomic weight. Lithium, sodium, potassium, and rubidium were all extremely prone to reacting with chlorine, fluorine, iodine, and bromine. Beryllium, magnesium, calcium, and strontium were all similar but less reactive. But with a quick inspection, you, and to be fair, a number of other chemists, realized that there was a relationship between atomic weights, but it's periodic. At the beginning of the list of elements, characteristics repeat every seven elements. On the side here, we now know that it's every eight elements, but in the 1860s, elements were studied based on their reactivity. So the non-reactive noble gases had not yet been discovered, so the period occurred every seven elements. As the mass of the elements increases, the repetition starts to look a little less periodic, though it's certainly still there, it just isn't perfect. Some of your colleagues, they're saying, well, such is life. It was perfect repetition early on, but later in the list it gets a little fuzzier. But not you. You become obsessed. Obsessed with the perfection of the periodicity. You write out the names and weights and properties of elements on cards, you lay them across your desk, shuffle them, tear them to pieces in frustration until one day you realize that you're simply missing cards. The numbers aren't working, not because there's something wrong with your ideas but because some elements simply haven't been discovered yet. Along with this insight, you insert gaps into the table, and things suddenly fall perfectly into place. Seven element periods for the first two rows with hydrogen in its own category, 18 element periods for the next two rows. You're so certain that you predict the properties of these missing elements, and when a French scientist comes along and says that he has, in fact, discovered one of them, you argue with him, saying that you discovered it first in your mind. And when you see his data, and it doesn't match yours, you publish a paper saying his data for the new element he discovered is wrong. That's how certain you are of yourself and this beautiful new theoretical framework you've created. And you know what the really crazy thing is? You're right. That French guy's data was wrong. You, never having examined the element he discovered, knew more about it than he did. Because you are Mendeleev. Master of the elements. <laughs> okay, we're done imagining for the episode. That was fun though. The different groups Mendeleev had identified are a lot of the same groups that we study today. Starting at the left, we have the soft, shiny, extremely reactive alkaline metals. So reactive, in fact, that they have to be stored in inert gases or oil to prevent them from reacting with the atmosphere. Alkaline metal want nothing more than to dump off an electron and form a positive ion or cation. And they're always jonesing to hook up with a hottie from the other side of the table. So, of course, Seeing as they're so reactive, you don't find hunks of them lying around in nature. Instead, chemists must extract them from compounds containing them. Next, you have the alkaline earth metals. Reactive metals, but not as reactive as the alkali metals, forming cations with two positive charges instead of just one. Calcium, shown here, undergoes a very similar reaction to sodium and water, just a little more slowly, producing a little less heat. The middle body area of the table is made up of a nice solid rectangle of transition metals, these are the metals you think of as metals, with iron and nickel and gold and platinum. The majority of elements are metals. They're fairly unreactive, great conductors of heat, but more importantly for us, good conductors of electricity. They're malleable and can be bent and formed and hammered into sheets, 
and they're extremely important in chemistry, but overall surprisingly similar to each other. On the far right, just over from the noble gases, the halogens make up a set of extremely reactive gases that form negative ions or anions with one negative charge and love to react with the alkali and alkyl earth metals. The rectangle between the halogens and the transition metals contain a peculiar scatter shot of metals, metalloids, gases, and nonmetals. These guys don't end up as ions unless you take extreme action and start shooting other ions at them. So generally, a bit boring over here, though lots of interesting covalent organic chemistry. We'll get to that. Down below in their own little island are the lanthanides and actinides, metals that were largely undiscovered in Mendeleev's day because they're so similar that it's next to impossible to separate them from each other. And finally, on the far, far right, also undiscovered when Mendeleev built his chart, the completely unreactive noble gases. Like a lot of other obsessive scientists, Mendeleev never thought he was done with his table, so he held it back for quite a while, only publishing it as part of a new chemistry textbook he was working on as a way to make some quick cash that he needed. And as with many other scientific revelations, there were a number of other people hot on this discovery's trail. As many as six people published on the periodicity of elements at roughly the same time as Mendeleev, but a few things set him apart. One, he was obsessive. He knew the data better than anyone else and had spent a ton of time working on a theory that many people thought was just an interesting little quirk. And two, he realized in a way no one else did that the idea of periodicity had far-reaching consequences. It seems as if he had a deep belief in the cosmic importance of what he was doing, almost a religious fascination. Mendeleev believed in God, but also he believed that organized religions were false paths to the unknowable nature of God. I like to believe that he thought he saw some divine pattern in his tables, and Mendeleev felt as if he was coming to know God in a way that no other man ever had. To be clear, this is pure conjecture. And as we now know, the periodicity of elements is a physical phenomenon. It's a function of electrons, which are, in some ways, pretty dang peculiar, but certainly not at all mystical. But we'll get to that peculiar physical reality in the next episode. The periodic table that we know and love, I love it anyway, is a representation of reality, a way of understanding and sorting the universe as it exists. But that form of the table is not by any means set in stone. Indeed, a contemporary of Mendeleev envisioned the table set onto a screw or cylinder with the elements wrapping around from one side to another. While Mendeleev's table looks more like a map up on a wall, de Champotois, a geologist, envisioned more of a globe. Unfortunately for de Champotois, no publisher could figure out how to print his cylindrical three-dimensional table, and so he published his paper without a graphical representation of his periodic cylinder of the elements and it was largely ignored. I guess they didn't have paper graphs back then. I am a huge fan of this cut and tape model of the periodic table. You can make your own, there's a link in the description. And there are also a ton of other designs for periodic tables that have various advantages over the one that we're all familiar with. Our periodic table as it stands is really a little bit unhappy with itself, frankly. The lanthanides and actinides really should be part of the table, but we separate them out because it's hard to fit that on a piece of paper. Really, this is what it should look like. And really, it would be best if it wrapped around into a circle so that fluorine and neon and sodium were all next to each other instead of being on the opposite sides of the map. Is there just one proton away? Mendeleev's contribution, nonetheless, is more powerful than at first it seemed. He ended up forming a guide to help future chemists understand things that wouldn't be discovered for 25, 50, even 100 years. Indeed, after Mendeleev's theories were published and accepted, the overwhelming cry from the scientific community was, why? 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 And though Mendeleev was not himself concerned with this stuff, he actually denied the existence of atoms, or indeed anything he couldn't see with his own eyes. It turned out that the answer to the first why was the electron. That sneaky little electron Mendeleev, if he'd been around to see their discovery, he would have hated them. But you, you will have a healthy respect for them after you learn all about them on the next episode of Crash Course Chemistry. Thank you for watching this episode of Crash Course Chemistry. If you were paying attention, you now know the terrible, beautiful, and wonderful story of Dmitry Mendeleev, how he organized the elements into the periodic table, some of the basics of the relationships on that table, why Mendeleev stood out from his colleagues, and how the table as we know it today could stand some improvement. This is okay. So there's a quick overview, not just of Mendeleev, but also of the periodic table. Can you the light screen, Mason? So Mendeleev was this genius guy like 300 years ago, and he figured out the periodicity, or what we call the periodic law. Every so many elements, there is a repetition, a repeated pattern. 
Okay, here's Mendeleev's table of 1871. And again, it looks a lot different than ours does today because a lot of these elements were undiscovered. He didn't know they existed. Now, there's a couple I want to point out here. These three in the middle were ones that he predicted they would be, exist. And that's when, when Hank was talking about the fact that a French guy discovered one of those elements and published a paper, Mendeleev said, uh-uh, your dad is wrong. And he, he had predicted already that these elements should be here because there can't be a hole in the middle of the periodic table. And he argued with the guy and published a paper saying his dad was wrong and Mendeleev was right. So Mendeleev was a master again of figuring out how these elements all fit together. Okay, so here's the theory of periodicity. So in your notes, I think we had it for a, a um, definition in your bell workbook last week. Periodicity is a tendency to recur at regular intervals, so what we call a periodic or a repeating pattern. Why do I keep doing that? Okay, a repeating pattern that predicts properties. A lot of P's in that, periodicity. A repeating pattern that predicts properties. That's a cool, that's a cool definition. That's my definition, it's a little bit shorter than this one. Okay, what is periodicity? A repeating pattern that predicts properties. Remember I say repeating pattern predicts properties. Repeating pattern predicts properties. Again, repeating pattern predicts properties. Good. And that's periodicity. Okay, it was, it was started by Doberreiner and finished up by Mendeleev. Okay, and the great thing about Mendeleev's work that set him apart is he predicted elements that wouldn't be discovered for 50 or 100 years. He knew they had to be there. Okay? So you can write out this whole thing, but I don't recommend it. I like a repeated pattern for predicting properties. Periodicity. All of those P's. There's only one word in that that doesn't start with P. Repeated. And it's got a P in the middle. Good? Okay. Now, by applying periodicity, the periodic properties were the result of organizing the elements by their atomic number. Please note this right here. I'm going to put my little marker out here go with the big fat red one on here. Okay, atomic number. This was where Mendeleev was set apart from everybody that came before him. Everybody else was trying to organize these elements by their mass. And there was a couple problems. I'll show you here real quick. Um, the 51, see cobalt and nickel right here? Notice the masses don't go up, they go down. So if you're trying to organize cobalt and nickel, you put nickel first and cobalt second. But that has to do with the number of neutrons again. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how many protons. So the whole periodic table has to do with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The number of protons, which is the atomic number, not the mass. There's three or four places in the periodic table where the mass goes down or stays almost the same. Nickel and copper, I mean cobalt and nickel is one of them here. And over here, tellurium and iodine, 127 goes down to 126. Okay? So there's some definite problems with trying to organize it by mass. So the key of Mendeleev's table was he organized it by properties and by atomic number. Okay, so here's uh, one of the predictions. This is a chart from your book showing the prediction of what we call today aluminum and silicon. Okay, so, um, or this is germanium. Germanium was one of the ones right here underneath silicon. He called it eca silicon. He predicted it in 1869. Okay, it was discovered about 20 years later. And look how close these numbers are. Okay, he predicted even the color of it because he said this is going to be very similar to silicon. It's going to have the same properties as silicon. So it's going to have this color, it's going to have this density. It's going to have a very high melting point. It's going to have, it's going to react with oxygen in a two to one ratio, law of definite proportions. Um, he nailed it on density. Check that out. Okay. So this is the one of the 
the elements that Mendeleev predicted, germanium, and it's right there, GD. Okay, it's right underneath silicon. He said this is going to be a proper, uh, uh, an element that's very similar to silicon. He also predicted um, a couple others. One of them was this one here, which we call gallium. Okay, uh, this is the periodic table from your book. It has a big gap in the middle because it's actually a photocopy from your book, which is on page, I believe. Let's see if we can find it here. It's in a chapter three. It should be in chapter three, but not in chapter four. Hmm. Somewhere in here. There we go. Page 92 and 93. Okay, it's also in the back cover of your book. So it's in a couple different places. Chapter 3, back cover, on the wall up here, a couple different places around the classroom. So the periodic table today consists of all these things. The color-coded one in your book is really cool. And I'm going to go through some of this right now. Okay, notice every element has either a one or two letter symbol. The symbol has to be capitalized for the first letter and cannot be capitalized for the second letter. So if you take this quiz on Wednesday and you write beryllium, capital B, capital E, I'm going to mark it wrong. It has to be capital B, small e. Okay? Because if you write capital B, capital E, you're telling me boron, okay, which is capital B, and then something that starts with capital E, and there's Einsteinium down here, which has, and I could confuse it. So the capitalization is very important. Aluminum, capital A, small l, okay? Silicon, capital S, small i. If I write capital S, capital I, guess what I've got? I've got sulfur iodine. So it's important that you get the right first letters, always capitalized, second letter, always lowercase. There are none anymore that have three letters. These ones here were just named last year, 2016 actually, two years ago now. Okay? So these ones, that's why I've got them written up here. All of your old, your textbook still has some really old labeling for these elements here. So they are now called Nihomium, Fluorovium, um, MC is Moscovium, named after Moscow. Uh, Livermorium, which is a city in California. Tennessee, which is named after the state of Tennessee. And Oganesson, which is some Russian thing. There's a lot of Russian, a lot of Germans, a lot of United States discoveries here. Okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, let's talk about the labeling on the periodic table real quick. You know most of this already. Let me back up here. Okay, so every block on the periodic table has a symbol, and the small number above it, we had this on the last test, is the atomic number. The big number on that block is always going to be the atomic mass, the average atomic mass. Now, your table is really cool. It's got some nice symbols on here. And you'll see here, the state of matter, solid, liquid, or gas. So they've got a little balloon. Do I see these? Notice all the gases over here. All the gases are on the right-hand side. That's no coincidence. There's only two liquids on the whole periodic table. They are bromine, right here, and mercury, right here. Please write that down, because that's one of the things that might show up hint, 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 on the test. Okay? What are the, since there's only two of them, I want you to know which two are the only two liquids at room temperature on the periodic table. Bromine, over here and mercury, Hg, which is one of the ones you're going to learn tonight. There's also an awful lot of solids. Does everybody see? With the exception of the two liquids and these couple gases over here, everything else is solid. Like 90, nah, probably about 85% of the periodic table is solid. Now, the circle ones that look like donuts down here at the bottom, those are man-made ones. They're called synthetic. Synthetic means we haven't found them in nature. They only exist as a man-made particle or compound. And even this one down here, which is the number 118, would probably be a gas, even though it's man-made, because all of that last column are gases. 
Okay, so you have a little code here in your book that says gas, liquid, solid, or synthetic. 85% of these roughly solids. Two liquids and you can count them up probably about a dozen gases. Also on your table here, there's a color code. And mine on the wall is a little bit different. Okay, on this one up here, everything that's blue, everybody see that? That's like the dark blue over here, lighter blue in the middle, and even aluminum, gallium, tin, bismuth, and livermorium. These are all metals. So on my table, everything that's blue is a metal. On this table, everything that's blue is a metal. And there's a lot of them. Would you say some? Half, half, or mostly metals? Mostly metals. So most of the elements in the universe are metals. Okay? You can see all the different ones down here. Now, there's a few that are non-metals. On my periodic table up here, the green ones, which includes everything to the right of the red ones, okay, this whole corner right here, is non-metals. They are gases and one liquid that do not conduct electricity. We'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute. But these on your table are in the dark, I don't know what you call that, yellow? Back cover, yeah, yellow. It's yellow in your book. It's green on my chart up here. Now what's in between these, you have to know those, okay? Those are called the metalloids or the semi-metals. So metalloids is a M-E-T-A-L, L-O-I-D-S, sometimes called semi. What does semi mean? Where is it? Semi. Semicircle. Not a full, like half. Like half, yeah. Sometimes they're called semi-metals or metalloids is the more common word. These ones right here that are in your book, green, on my table they're red, are kind of half metal, half non-metal. They're, they sit on the fence. They have some properties of metals, have some properties of non-metals. And I want you to be able to find them on the periodic table. So I'm going to show you how to find them. The way I call this, I call this the staircase. Okay, right between boron and aluminum here, I start a horizontal line. And on this one up here, it's kind of a dark black. And you go over, down, over, down, over, down, over, down, over, down. Make a staircase. So from this point forward, if you hear me talk about the staircase, that's the staircase we're talking about. Now, with the exception of aluminum, which we all know is definitely a metal, like aluminum on your car, aluminum roofs, aluminum pieces in your house, aluminum is what this is made out of, aluminum is the frame of that window over there. Okay, aluminum is definitely a metal. Then everything above and below the staircase, above here, above and below, above and below, above and below, above and below, are called metalloids. Okay? So yeah, I want you to know how to draw the staircase. You start right between boron and aluminum. You go over, down, over, down, over, down, over, down, over, down. And then you can take it. Everyone that's above or below it are going to be your metalloids, with the exception of aluminum. Definitely metal. So we have metals, metalloids, and non-metals. I'm going to show this to you. I found this yesterday, and if anybody really wants to um, learn the periodic table, this is an interactive periodic table. And I will uh, send you a link to it if you're interested tonight. It is so cool if you like this kind of stuff, which I do. Okay, so take a look up here. You can click on any element here, and it shows it in the box in the middle. So I've highlighted phosphorus. My cursor here, it shows phosphorus. It shows, I can go here. I can look at the properties of phosphorus. Melting point, boiling point, electroactivity. There's literally a dozen different characteristics here, physical properties. I can go to orbitals, which you don't know about yet, but we'll get to in a couple chapters. I can go to isotopes, which we did talk about in the last chapter, and it shows me a bunch of different isotopes of phosphorus, and how many isotopes there are. <coughs> I can go to compounds here, and it shows me 
dozens and dozens and dozens of different compounds that have phosphorus in them. Okay? If that's what I've got highlighted. Phosphorus, black phosphorus, red phosphorus, white phosphorus, gallium phosphide, hafnium. I mean, there's just hundreds of different compounds that use every element. And here's just a list of them with their formulas. Okay? So we've got compounds. We can click on names, names of different compounds. So there's so much stuff here to explore. If anybody's, again, just be looking for some little review, okay? This is a really cool resource. It's called the PT table, um, or P table, periodic table, get it? And um, there's all kinds of buttons to click on here, wide version. Ooh, that's cool. Hang on. <coughs> So this is the wide version of the periodic table. Notice how wide it is. Down here you'll see these are actually inserted in the middle. So what, what Hank was talking about in the video, you see here, I've got thorium starting at number 90, and I've got cesium starting at number 58. These long stretches of elements, there's 14 of them in each, they actually fit right in there where that black line is. Okay, so this thing is really long if we do it the right way. But again, since we can't print that in a book easily, we usually cut them out and stick them at the bottom. So if I go to the non-wide version, okay, you'll see at the bottom, we usually stick them down here at the bottom. And they actually fit in the here. So 57 to 71 goes right in there. 89 to 103 goes right in here. Okay, Because obviously, we wouldn't skip from 57 to 72. That's your clue. Why would I go from 57 to 72? If these ones, 58 through 71, fit right in there. And that'll make sense to you as we work through this in a couple more chapters. Okay. You should know that there are 118 elements. If you ever forget, you can look right up there. That last element was discovered about five years ago. And again, by discovered, I mean that scientists in the lab smashed a couple atoms together. They stuck together for a fraction of a second with a mass of 118, or an atomic number of 118 protons. And so, but uh, if you can make it happen more than a couple times in a row, you have discovered a new element. 118 is the total. How many occur in nature? 92. So number 92 right here, uranium which is on your list to learn tonight. Uranium is important because we use it in bombs and in producing electricity. Uh, but uranium is the biggest naturally occurring element found on Earth. Okay? So, so far, that's the heaviest one. 92 naturally occurring, 118 total. So, how about number 119? Has anybody discovered it yet? No. If scientists do, and scientists are working around the world, trying to discover element 119, nobody's been successful yet. Whoever's the first to get it gets to become famous, right? And it will eventually go down here underneath number 87. I'm about to go home, so I'm Yeah, I just dropped there. I'll get you later. Thank you, Sam. Okay, so atomic number 19, 119 doesn't exist, but scientists probably in the next 10 years, who knows, somebody may discover it. Okay, notice that the atomic numbers start with one, and it goes to two, and goes to three, and goes to four. So every time we go up the periodic table by one element, we're adding one proton and one electron. Now the number of neutrons changes, because that's our isotopes. But if I go in all the way down here to 118, how many protons? Just like we did last week. You're right, how many electrons? Well, how many protons? Good. And if I want to figure out neutrons, I have to do that subtract thing, 294 minus 180. Okay, so the atomic number increases by one every time we go up one on the periodic table. Okay, now with the exception of the first row, all of these are metals. You see metal, 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 and they all end up with gases over here. And this is part, again, of that periodic law. Okay, you see a pattern. All the gases, these are called the noble gases, right here. What are the noble gases, and why are they called that? Does anybody remember your history from the Middle Ages, okay, European Middle Ages history? Okay, we had basically a lot of thousands of kingdoms all around Europe, right? And there was a king and his queen, 
and their, their court. And where did they live? Where would the king and the queen live? Anybody? Raise your hand. Trey? King and queen live where? In the castle. Good. Surrounding the castle is farmland. Who works the farms? What do we call them? Farmers? Yeah, but in those days they were called peasants or serfs. Okay? Okay, now, was it common, if you know a little bit of history, for the king and the queen to invite the peasants into their castle? No. Okay? In fact, the nobility, the kings and the queens and the counts and the countesses and the barons and the baronesses and the earls and the, all the people that had the fancy titles, they didn't deal with the common people, right? They wouldn't interact with the commoners, the serfs, the peasants, the farmers. They were nobles. Did I get this? So when we call these noble gases, we call them that because they don't interact with hardly any of the other elements. They are so, and again this gets down to electrons, they are so satisfied with their well-being that they don't react. So the noble gases is the last column of the periodic table here from helium all the way down. And they are called nobles because they don't interact. If I write down, the noble gases don't interact, which means they don't react. Sometimes they're called inert, I-N-E-R-T gases, which means they won't react. So why are they called nobles? Because the rest of the periodic table is all your, your farmers, your commoners, your serfs, your peasants. And they're too high and mighty. They live in their castle and they're fat, fat and I call it fat, dumb, and happy. Okay? And they got all the money they could possibly want because they get to tax all these guys over here. Okay, the idea that physical and chemical properties are repeated in a regular pattern, periodic law, to very similar periodicity that we looked at just a minute ago. Okay? A repeated pattern of predicted properties, physical and chemical properties. So periodic law and periodicity are essentially the same thing. One's an adjective and one's a noun. Okay, and that's the end of section one. The return of the full moon every 28 days is an example of, who wants to take a guess at this one here? Phases, periodicity, frequency, or periodic law. That's a little tricky question. Who's going to hazard a guess here? Cole, let's try Make sure this one's periodicity. Yeah. I'll, I'll side with you on that. Which most unreactive elements are found in which group? So, real quick, what is a group? Hang on. Group 1, group 2, group 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, sometimes called 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Guys, have a great day. Don't forget about the moment tonight. Have an awesome Monday.